so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. Rockley Stone Waste Management Facility in Turong, some 60 kilometres south of Melbourne, is a tip. A tip like any other, with mounds of indistinguishable rubbish stretching hundreds of metres. For residents of nearby Mornington, this is the place their household rubbish ends up. But by May 2004, it's also become the site of a police search for two bodies. 100 officers have been digging up piles of waste for 10 straight days in the hopes of finding 41-year-old Anna Kemp and her 20-month-old daughter, Gracie. Among the team is Detective Narelle Fraser from Victoria's Missing Persons Unit. Each time Narelle gears up to look for the mother and child, she needs a fresh protective suit as a safeguard from the risks of trudging through the asbestos-riddled mud. Heavy-duty masks will keep her lungs safe, but they do little to dull the horrific stench all around her. It's windy, raining and cold. There are rats everywhere. Four excavators have narrowed their search to a 100-metre radius, while officers use rakes and shovels, anything they can to sift through the waste. Their task is clear to find two blue bags suspected of containing the remains of Anna and her daughter, Gracie. But it's a garbage tip. There are thousands of blue bags. And every time one is discovered, the excavators must halt as it's inspected. As this stop-start effort continues into its 11th day, the team are told they've got one last chance to find the pair. The relentless search is taking a toll, costing some half a million dollars a day as officers volunteer their days off and spare time to join the effort. Narelle Fraser has been wading through metres of waste and mud for over a week and she never wants to see another blue bag again until she spies one that doesn't seem right. Narelle opens the bag and discovers the evidence they've been searching so tirelessly for. I screamed at the top of my voice. It's the remains of Anna Kemp, bagged up and thrown out with the trash by the father of her unborn child. I'm Emma Gillespie and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. Today's episode is about one of Victoria's most disturbing cases of familicide. The death of Anna Kemp and her daughter Gracie at the hands of John Sharp, the husband and father whose crimes would see him branded the Mornington Monster. It's a crime that many Australians would remember, due in most part to a televised address in 2004. As John Sharp pled for the return of his missing wife and young daughter, he instead ignited suspicion and scepticism, setting the public's imagination wild. The Sharp family murders is a case today's guest will never forget. Narelle Fraser is a former Victorian police officer whose discoveries were instrumental in solving this case and bringing the Mornington monster to justice. Her podcast, Narelle Fraser Interviews, examines the human side of the impact of crime, and she joins me now to discuss this shocking case and her role in finding out what happened to Anna and Gracie. And just a heads up before we start, this episode contains descriptions of extreme domestic violence. Listener discretion is advised. How did Anna meet John? They met at the Commonwealth Bank. They were, you know, colleagues at the bank. And I think they got together, you know, fairly sort of quickly after meeting. 
Anna was from New Zealand. She'd come over from New Zealand, came from a, you know, loving sort of mum and dad and brothers. And, uh, yeah, she came over here, met John, got married, and they moved into a place in, in Mornington. And then little Gracie was born, 2002, something like that. Was it a happy marriage? What do we know about their relationship leading up to the birth of Gracie up to the point of March 2004? From what we learned, from John's point of view, he wasn't very happy. Apparently from Anna, things were going very well. There was no indications that John was unhappy at all. And this is from conversations with Anna's mum and Anna's family. Things were going along fine with Anna, but unbeknownst to us, John felt that she was becoming very moody, very controlling. But again, Anna had no idea. And in fact, Anna was pregnant with their second child when she was actually murdered in March 2004. And I think she was about 20 weeks, something like that. So You know, according to Anna, everything was fine, but John had other ideas. What was Anna's reaction, do we know, to the news that she was pregnant for a second time compared to John's? Were there contrasting attitudes towards bringing another child into their family? Looking back, you'd have to say yes, but at the time, Anna, well, she was thrilled with her husband that she loves, everything is going along fine. But apparently John said to her at one stage, are you sure it's mine? Like he couldn't believe that she was pregnant. I mean, I'm not sure how you couldn't believe that your wife was pregnant. However, he was very surprised. Apparently he was very unhappy with the second child and maybe that was the catalyst for him doing what he ultimately did. I don't know. Do we know much about Anna and John as parents? What was their relationship like with Gracie? It was very, very tense because little Gracie, when she was born, she had, I think it's referred to as hip dysplasia. And so what happened was from virtually the moment she was born, she was put into a brace. So she had trouble sleeping, as did the parents. And hip dysplasia is not a lifelong condition. It's something with these braces or with this treatment that it can be fixed. So it was a matter of maybe, I don't know, six or 12 months of Gracie in and out of this brace and she would be okay. But it caused quite a lot of tension between the marriage. And I know that was probably one of the only things that Anna had said to her mum. So I'd have to say in those last couple of months, it was probably quite tense with little Gracie's diagnosis of her hip dysplasia. By March 2004, we know that Anna is pregnant. She's going through with the pregnancy, but she disappears. How is the alarm raised? The alarm is raised by her mother. Anna and her mum were very close. Her mum lives in New Zealand. And Anna would ring her mum every couple of days or her mum would ring her, one of the two. But her mum rang her a couple of times and she didn't answer. This is in March of 2004. And she rang a couple of times, a couple of days apart, and she couldn't get on to Anna. And she was a bit concerned and she rang John. And John said, oh, I don't know, she's uh, shopping or she's taken Gracie to kinder or something like that. But Anna's mum kept ringing John saying, John, I'm still trying to contact her. What is wrong? I, I And so John kept making all these excuses. And in the end, after all these phone calls back and forth between Anna's mum and John, John actually came out and said to Anna's mum, look, I have to tell you, she's met somebody else and she's left me and she's living with this other man. So Anna's mum she just knew. She had that gut feeling that something was very wrong. In this time, Anna's mum, it was her birthday, and she received this text from Anna that just didn't seem, I think we all know our loved ones, the way they write texts and the words they use and how they use them. And Anna's mum knew, just in the pit of her stomach, she knew that this 
text wasn't from Anna. And then she received a bunch of flowers for her birthday from Anna. And the card on the flowers, apparently the words on the card again, there was just alarm bells everywhere. So she ended up ringing the local New Zealand police and making a report of her daughter missing. And so they did their, let's call it immediate action over there. They made a few inquiries. They rang John as well, the New Zealand police. He said the same thing to them, that uh, she had met somebody else. They asked a few questions. He mentioned something about seeing a, it was a blue car or a green car down the road a couple of weeks ago and it had picked up Anna. But he basically kept that facade, that story with the New Zealand police. They smelled a rat. They knew something wasn't right as well. They rang the Mornington Police, which is the local police station to where John and Anna lived. They rang there and that's where the local police sprung into action and they did what most police you would hope and they did do. They went straight around to John's and Anna's house. John asked them in. He was very obliging. They sat at the kitchen table. He was very upset, the fact that his wife had uh, left him for somebody else. They had a cursory look around and uh, they left. But apparently when they left the house, this is the Mornington police, they also smelled a rat. Isn't it funny about that gut instinct again? They just didn't feel right. And I think if my memory serves me correctly, they rang the missing persons unit where I was They rang almost immediately. They walked out the door of John Sharp's house to say, there's something not right here. We've just been around. So we had a look at the job or our analyst at Missing Persons had a look at the job, just a quick cursory look, had a quick look to see if we could find anything to suggest that Anna was missing, as in phone records, banking records, all that sort of thing. And just on the initial search our analyst did, Anna was still alive and well. So our boss, obviously, at Missing Persons Unit had a look at it and we all sort of sat around, had a quick look, had a quick discussion, a quick briefing, and our boss, you know, he picked out who was on their way down to uh, Mornington. So I think it was actually that night or the following morning, but it was hours after Mornington had been around to John's that we actually went down to Mornington and started the investigation. Was an affair a believable idea at the time for John to tell the loved ones of Anna that she had hightailed it out of town with some other guy? You know, what kind of a person do we know that she was, kind of a mother, kind of a wife? Does any of that align with that idea that she might have done that? No. I mean, certainly... From a, an investigator's point of view, you would certainly have to factor that into, you know, like your avenues of inquiry and what could have happened. You would never, ever discount that. But, you know, from her family, I think the fact that she was apart from a little bit of tension about Gracie's hip dysplasia, I think the family couldn't believe that she'd had an affair because she's what is she, 20 weeks pregnant with their second child? I don't think there was anybody that believed John, but also I don't think anybody could go that next step and believe, well, if she hasn't had an affair, where is she? And that, you know, he had done what he'd done. You just couldn't fathom that. But, yeah, as an investigator, completely different. We have to consider that. And I think you wouldn't be doing your job if you didn't. You have to have a very, very open mind and consider all possibilities. Where was Gracie supposed to be at this time? What was John saying about her? John apparently had Gracie for a couple of days and then Anna had, this is his story, that she was missing her mum and that she needed to be with her mum. So Anna had come and got her and that Gracie was actually staying with Anna and uh, the new boyfriend or the, the new partner. And John also said that they had been back to the house at Mornington a couple of times, this is Anna, and little Gracie, because Gracie didn't have a cot in her new house. And so they took Gracie's cot 
and a couple of other things that apparently she'd come back for. Yeah, so he had it pretty well planned. As you've mentioned, this was a joint effort between the alarm is raised in New Zealand where Anna's mum is to Mornington, then to you in missing persons. Yeah. Was that unusual to be working across those different agencies? Did that make things harder? Was there a delay or was there a lot of cooperation in those early days? Oh, no, I could only praise the way that all the police work together. Look, when you have concerns for a little girl's safety, I'm not saying that we wouldn't do that if it was an adult, but added into that fact that there was a little girl in the middle of all this, I think that, as I've said before, it just takes it to another level. But I can only commend the way that the New Zealand police responded to the initial complaint by Anna's mum and then Mornington. They were also very, very cooperative. And in fact, you can't work as a squad like Missing Persons Unit. You just can't work on your own. You need the people on the ground, the people in, say, in this instance, in Mornington, they know the local area, they know the local crooks, they know, I don't know, places where somebody might dump a body. Like they have such intimate knowledge of their local area. And I know when we went down, you know, hours later after we received the information from Mornington, we were sitting down around a table and having a briefing by the Mornington police. And that included the uniform, the CI, as in the detectives. And it's all about sharing the information that you have so that, I mean, we need to find out what's happened. So uh, the local police in Mornington did an amazing job. They were instrumental, but so were New Zealand. So I think generally, yes, you all work together. It's very unusual not to. (laughs) You've told us that when this case came into your team that everyone smelled a rat, but the thoughts were still leaning towards Anna being alive and well. The phone is still being used, her bank account's being used. She's sending flowers to her mother. On paper, she is alive. When did you begin to shift your focus to foul play being involved? The minute we had the briefing from Mornington, I think we all felt there was something not right. And I don't think anyone really believed that Anna had had an affair, although it was a possibility. It was just like Anna and Gracie had disappeared off the face of the earth. But the problem we had was that her phone was still being used. Her bank account was still being used. You know, there had been $200 taken out only, I don't know, say a couple of days before. So in the back of our minds, Yes, it was a possibility, but that morning at the briefing, oh, there was just so many, I don't know, maybe to the trained eye, there were so many concerns and so many areas where just things weren't making sense, particularly talking to Anna's mum and just knowing Anna, Anna wouldn't have had an affair. It was a furphy and Anna's mum knew it and i I believe we knew it, although it didn't make a difference to, you know, us conducting the investigation. We had to go down every single rabbit hole to confirm whether or not she was actually having an affair. We had to check, had she got on a bus and gone interstate? Had she got on a plane? Had she, I don't know, gone to a little B&B, had a bit of time out because things were, you know, a bit tense at home? So... I'd have to say from the minute we, well, the minute we got the job, we thought there was something not quite right. But going down to Mornington and sitting around that table, it was like, oh, my God, you know, we're really, we're looking at a murder here. What response is then taken? Is John monitored, placed under surveillance? What do you find out in those next critical days? It's what we don't find out more than what we find out. We can't find any indication that Anna 
has got into a car. We did a door knock of the area to see if anybody had seen this blue car. Nothing. We speak to Anna's friends. There is nothing to indicate to them that she's had an affair. Like there was just nothing. We couldn't find any indication of Anna being anywhere, but we still had that issue of her phone and her credit card being used. So one of the things you have to think about, yes, is surveillance. Is it worth putting surveillance on him? But there's no point in putting a listening device, an LD, in his house because John was quite a loner and he didn't have very many friends that we could find. Anna had lots of girlfriends. Anna was very social, but John wasn't. So we couldn't think about putting an LD, for instance, on his phone because he hardly rang anyone. We couldn't think about putting an LD in the house because he didn't talk to anybody. So the next consideration was, well, do we put a tracker in his car? So we thought, well, that's better than nothing. So we put a tracker in his car, but also we decided to put what we call put the dogs on him. The dogs are a term we use for surveillance police, you know, the plain car, plain clothes, they just look like any Tom, Dick or Harry in the street. And what we decided, we put the dogs on him just to see what he was doing. We um, pumped up the investigation and we started talking to John a lot and just sort of trying to get him a bit off guard, let's say, and maybe do something that he wouldn't normally do, put him under a bit of pressure. And then one of the TV stations were going to do an interview and we thought that, you know, could help us. We don't know what he'd do after the interview. He might go and sit down by the beach and contemplate life. We didn't know what he was going to do, but it sort of coincided really well with our surveillance on him. And I've got to say, it was one of the few times that it works perfectly. It was totally unexpected what we found. But what happened was, this was probably one of the best days of my career, was when John did the television interview, I think it was seven or nine, they went down to John's parents' house, that's where he was staying, to get some comfort because of his missing wife. He was terribly distressed and worried about her. On the interview, I think a lot of people would have seen it where he's crying, those crocodile tears, holding a photo of little Gracie and pleading with Anna to contact the police or contact him. I just want to know you're safe, all that sort of carry on. That's all I'm really worried about, my daughter. If I could just come forward and even if you don't ring me, just the media or police or her family. After the interview, the dogs watched him I followed him and he left his dad's and he drove down to the Chelsea beach. She gets out of the car and he sort of looks around, seeing if anybody's around. And this is all on video. The dogs are placed so that they can watch him. And he goes to, it was a bush near some public toilets. And he goes under the bush and he fossicks around and he brings out a white plastic bag, just a shopping bag, a Coles or Woolies shopping bag or something. And he goes back to the car, hops in the car, and he gets a phone out of the bag and he makes a phone call. Obviously, at the time, we don't know who to, but he makes a phone call. He then puts the phone back in the bag and he then drives up to a Chelsea ATM, puts a credit card in the ATM, takes out a couple of hundred dollars, puts it back in the bag, gets back in the car, drives back down to the Chelsea Beach with the bag. He then goes and puts it under the bush again, buries it sort of, gets back in the car and then goes back home. And what he does then is he rings our office and he says, you're not going to believe this, but Anna's just rung me. And we know the phone call that he has made is from Anna's phone. That was when we knew it is him. He's the one that's been using Anna's phone. And he also said to us, I've just had $200 taken out of our account at Chelsea. 
And I remember that afternoon, the whole team, it was like we'd won Cats Lotto. And we sort of had in a way. Isn't that terrible? That sounds wrong. But in one sense, we were elated. But in another sense, it was a sense of dread because it confirmed to us that he had murdered Anna. But then we thought, could he have murdered Gracie? And that thought was just too hard to even contemplate, to think that a father could actually murder his little girl. So, I mean, it really stepped up then, obviously, the whole investigation. And what we did was for about a oh, at least a couple of days, the dogs kept on him, and this was way out of my, you know, like these were decisions that were made by, you know, an assistant commissioner in consultation with the missing person's bosses. But it was about when to arrest him because we had enough to arrest him, but whether to charge him, we just sort of were hoping that he may lead us to the bodies because that does happen every now and then. And so the dogs kept on him, I think, for a couple of days and he just, you know, sat at home. So eventually he was arrested and taken back to the missing persons unit and there was a team of, let's say, five or six of us and the two men that interviewed John were two of the best detectives I have ever worked with, the lovely Keno and Rocky. And at the time when they interviewed John, and this was the initial interview, he'd never been interviewed by the police before. We'd only, you know, got a statement from him and questioned him. But this was a formal interview and he was under arrest. But Keno and Rocky, they had daughters of their own, the age of Gracie. Like, can you imagine being in that position? <laughs> you don't know how a human being can do that. Was John surprised that he was a suspect all along? I just want to understand a bit about him emotionally as a person, what was going on in his head that he's sort of portraying this wounded husband and father, but from the very beginning, the day that this came across your desk, he was a suspect. I don't think anybody would know how John felt about anything. He was a closed book. He was very insular. He was, as I said, a, a loner. I don't think anybody, apart from maybe his parents, really understood anything about how John felt about anything. He was just, he was a very, very strange insular man. And he didn't show any emotion. He showed no personality. I think you could call him inept. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Emma Gillespie. I'm speaking with Narelle Fraser about the murder of Anna Kemp and her daughter, Gracie. Going back to that televised address, you know, so many people listening will remember watching John Sharp on their TVs, beaming into their homes, begging for his wife to reach out. I was a kid at the time and even I remember watching that and my parents talking about it and their own suspicions. How he presented to police during that time versus that televised address, what was it like for you watching that with your own suspicions and from a detective, a criminal investigative perspective, what can you tell me about his body language and what that might have revealed? He didn't show any like emotion other than these crocodile tears and, you know, where is she and why hasn't she contacted me? That was the persona he portrayed the whole time. And in the interview, Number one, I will never forget Rocky and Tenno and how they handled themselves. But the interview took a number of turns that, not that we weren't expecting, but just to watch that interview and it roll out the way it did, 
there were so many twists and turns in this investigation that I'd have to say really affected me. And I know it affected others and maybe they're not as open to admitting it as I am. But when he was interviewed, it's a bit CSI-ish, but we did have the two-way mirror. And so we could watch and listen to the interview, the other detectives who'd been involved in it. But I also remember a number of, you know, really high bosses like I don't think the Chief Commissioner was there, but I'm pretty sure there was a couple of ACs, Assistant Commissioners and definitely inspectors in the crime squads. And they came down and watched the interview. The first interview he did, he just stuck to his guns and said she'd had an affair and and we weren't getting anywhere. So there were some really big decisions made about how we were going to get him to talk because he certainly wasn't going to talk to anyone, any police person. And decisions were made about bringing in the mum and dad and talking to him. It was a big risk to involve the parents because we could lose the whole case because the parents were, you know, basically trying to get John to open up as well and to help us. God love the, you know, Victoria Police, but what they decided was we need to find where the bodies are rather than have a conviction. It's a big decision, isn't it? But it was about closure for Anna's family because by this stage we knew, you know, I mean, obviously it was him. And so, yeah, that was a big decision because we could lose the whole case. But finding Anna and Gracie was more important than any conviction. So we brought the parents in and... The parents were showed a little bit of the video that the dogs had taken so that they knew that, you know, this is what we know John has done and this is why we believe he's murdered them. And it worked beautifully. We left him alone with his parents for, I don't know, maybe an hour and that's when his parents came out and said he wants to talk to you and that's when he told us everything. And it was the most Heart wrenching. It's almost difficult. It's almost difficult to describe, but to hear a man talk about murdering his wife that was three months pregnant that was difficult enough. And he said this with no emotion whatsoever. What he said was he said that with Anna he'd been practicing with the spear gun in the shed for a couple of months just getting up the courage because she was really giving him the shits. And uh, this particular night, he was just fed up with it. She went to bed. He went and got the spear gun, took it upstairs. She was asleep. He shot her in the head. And I think she passed away very quickly. He then buried her in the backyard. And then I think the following day or a couple of days, I'm a little bit hazy here, but At some point, he dug her up and cut her up with a chainsaw, put her into a, you know, a bag and threw her out in the household rubbish. Like, this is his wife that's pregnant. I mean, to listen to that was difficult enough, but I kept thinking, what is coming next? And he told us about little Gracie. It's the most difficult interview I have ever listened to because I know that there were, I don't know, let's say 10 detectives in the room listening to all this. I was holding hands with somebody that was next to me. It was so difficult to listen to. But, you know, Rocky and Kenno, they just remained professional It was just such an important part of the investigation to listen to that and try and not show any emotion. You know, like how they did that, I don't know. But I remember at one stage there was a break in this interview and I went into the ladies' toilets and I remember with another couple of ladies, I just put my head in my hands. I just couldn't listen, but I had to listen. Oh, anyway, we went back and he told us about Gracie. I don't believe that he had actually thought about Gracie. I know that he had thought about what he was going to do with Anna. Like that was well planned because he had been to a fishing shop. 
He'd um, purchased a spear gun. He purchased the spears. He also bought a chainsaw. He knew what he was going to do. But I'm not sure if he'd thought about what he was going to do with Gracie. But anyway, so he's got Gracie for a couple of days and he starts thinking she really needs to be with her mum. So this particular night, he decides I'm going to kill her. He goes and has a couple of scotches. And he goes and gets a spear gun and Gracie's in her cot and he fires the spear gun into her head and that killed her. How did John seem detailing this in the interview room? Like he was saying what he'd had for breakfast that morning. That's what I mean. There was just no emotion. And then, as if that's not bad enough, He then puts her in a garbage bag and throws her out in the household rubbish. So obviously once you hear this extraordinarily disturbing confession, it's worst case scenario but also, you know, at least then there's a clear path for the investigation What comes next? How does attention then shift towards finding the bodies? Well, through a a series of phone calls and investigations, we find out that the rubbish is picked up from the house. It then goes to somewhere else and it then goes down to a transfer station. And so we understand that the bodies will be at the transfer station in Tarong. And it was actually a huge operation order to work out where the bodies would be, the equipment. The equipment was, I think it was costing something like half a million dollars a day. It was huge because we were talking about four big, I think they called front end loaders or a big machine that digs out dirt and all that. I think it's a front end loader. But who would ever think that a tip a transfer station, would have probably the best record keeping I have ever seen. And what the bosses did was they went down to the Tarong transfer station and they sat down with management of the transfer station and the transfer station records, it was like a grid. And so they could say, oh, from Prince Street, Mornington, that would have gone and they could put it in, I don't know, say a... 29. And so it was still a big area, probably around, I don't know, maybe uh, 100 metres by 100 metres, something like that. But they were able to pretty much establish that that's where they thought the bodies would probably be. And we were searching for 10 days. There was maybe 100 police involved in this search. And it was a huge search. We're looking for two blue bags. That was pretty much the description that John had given us, blue bags. So every blue bag that was found, you'd put your hand up, your whole team and the excavator would stop, you'd check to make sure that there was nothing in that bag and then you'd keep going. So it stopped and started all the time. I never want to see a blue bag again. There were thousands of them. And the noise down there, it was windy. It was raining, it was cold, it was rat infested, it was asbestos ridden so we had to have all these special suits on and just one thing, oh my God, to go to the toilet. It was almost worth wetting yourself for <laughs> because you had to go through the uh, the decontamination shower, you know, just to go to the toilet and then you'd have to put on all this new stuff because of the asbestos. You'd say you'd have to put on new suits, new socks, new shoes. Oh, my God. Anyway, 10th day, we get told the search is stopping tomorrow. We've given it our best shot and we haven't been able to find them. So the 11th day is the last day. Anyway, about, I don't know, mid-morning, 10 o'clock, something like that. I'm down in the depths. And as the excavator brought up this a whole lot of rubbish, there was a blue bag in it and it was just, you know, 
I'm sorry, but just like any other bag there. So as you do, you stop everything, you go and look at the bag, have a look and make sure. But this bag, I looked in it, I had to scramble up, I don't know, maybe three or four metres of rubbish to get to the bag. I opened the bag and there was nothing in there apart from I saw like a kitchen glove or something like that. So I said to keep going and so I would start to walk back down the mound and then I think to myself, that didn't seem right. I'll go back and have another look. And I went back and I opened the bag and I found an arm. And what I thought was the kitchen glove, it was an adult arm and hand. And, you know, I've thought about that since. And I know this sounds bizarre, but it was almost like Anna was reaching out to me. That's how how I felt that she was, you know, I'm here. And uh, so I stopped everything and I screamed at the top of my voice. I put my arms up. It was like I was just elated. I think that's the only word I can use because I knew that we had found Anna. So much of this story and this investigation, it strikes me that it's this combination of the dread and the harrowing darkness met with this intense motivation and drive to find the bodies to achieve justice for Anna and Gracie. These wins and that combination of devastation and elation for you working as a part of it. What was that like on that day you found her? Had you given up on thinking that you would? You know, day 11, every single time you see a blue plastic bag, you know, that constant feeling of hope being met with no, nothing, move along. What was that like for you? You know, funny you say that because this sounds bizarre, (laughs) but I knew I'd find her. I was that determined to make sure that Anna wouldn't end her life in this smelly, rat-infested, disgusting tip. I just had this bizarre, (laughs) unbelievable feeling. I just knew I'd find her. And you know what? I did. But When I did find her, as I said, I was just elated. And then the reality started to set in and I remember we had to wait for crime scene. You know, everybody came over to me. We were all hugging. We were all uh, jumping up and down. It was just a couple of minutes of pure elation. But then reality started to set in that, oh, my God, that means Gracie is really close by or we assumed that Gracie was close by and that thought of finding Gracie in that condition that we knew she probably would be was almost unbearable. But I know on that day when we found Anna, while we were waiting for crime scene, et cetera, which was probably uh, maybe a good hour, I can remember sitting on something And I put my head in my hands and I just cried. But I was so embarrassed that I was upset, you know, showing my emotion. Like not the elation, isn't it funny, I was happy to share that, but the fact that I was so upset physically that people could see I was crying, I turned away, I was just embarrassed, a bit humiliated to be honest, and I think I cried for what Anna had endured for Anna's family, for humanity as a whole, I suppose. But the thought of Gracie nearby, yeah, I will never forget what I just found. And I remember while we were waiting for crime scene, everybody left the scene and they went back up to the caravan where the cup of tea 200 was, what we call it, the little, the canteen. And I didn't want to leave Anna. 
I stayed there. I didn't want to go and have a copper. And I remember a colleague saying to me, come on, Fraze, we're going up to have a coffee and wait for crime scene. And I said, no, nah, I'm staying here with her. I just couldn't leave her again. You know, I, I couldn't leave her alone. A couple of days later it was lunchtime and we were, you know, we're all tired, and but we all wanted to find Gracie so much just for the family and for Gracie for that matter. So I can remember walking back towards the caravan and it was probably two or 300 metres and it was really windy. All this rubbish was flying around and a photo landed at the feet of, I don't know if it was me or somebody else, but the detective picked up the photo and said, does she look familiar to you? And I, she didn't, no. Anyway, I think it was Rocky, the detective sergeant, and I think someone showed him or Kenno, and they said, that's Anna. Like we knew we were close because there were photos of Anna and then as we kept picking up the photos, they were photos that had obviously been in a bag that John had discarded with Anna or with Gracie. And the following day is when they found Gracie and I wasn't there. I'm relieved that I wasn't there because I think that may have tipped me over the edge. The dedication of everyone involved in this investigation has been well documented and commended and it saw John sentenced to two consecutive terms of life imprisonment in 2005. Why do you think this case resonated with not just investigators but the community more broadly as well in such a way? I think firstly because it involves a young, innocent child. It also involves a beautiful mum who did nothing but, you know, bring one little girl into the world and was about to bring another baby into the world. And I don't think any of us can sort of understand how somebody could do that to anyone, let alone their wife and their little baby. I think it's got to be just the innocence was taken away so cruelly, but particularly with little Gracie, like with a little girl. You know, she had nothing to do with it. Like, I, as I said, I understand John had his issues with Anna. Why doesn't he just walk away? Why would you have to do what he did and not just murder them, like just torture them, really? Oh, oh. yeah, I don't know. I'm sort of at a loss for words. Thanks to Narelle for assisting us to tell this story. And if you'd like to hear more about the cases that Narelle solved, you can find a link to her podcast, Narelle Fraser Interviews, in our show notes. And if you're listening from Melbourne and you'd like to hear Narelle tell her stories firsthand, she's actually got a live show coming up on the 25th of February at the State Library of Victoria. You can find more information about that one in our show notes as well. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Emma Gillespie. The executive producer is Gia Moylan with assistant production by Cassie Merritt. Our audio design is by Rhiannon Mooney. If you've enjoyed today's episode, we would love it if you could leave us a review in whichever podcast app you're listening to right now. It helps other true crime fans find our content and it helps us to keep making the episodes that you get to enjoy every week. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back next week with another true crime conversation.